All right, as we come on here to Bridges Live on iHeart and iTunes Radio, we're about ready to come on here video live with um, podcast and YouTube. And you guys know it. If you listen to me, you know where to find me. So we're about ready to pop on with uh, Mental he Mental Health Mondays. I love the way that sounds. And so we're keeping it. We're stealing it. And if anyone owns it, they're going to have to, like, text me and charge me because it's it's really okay. We're We're... You, you agree, Doctor? Only we're keeping absolutely. it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we are keeping it. So, welcome to Mental Health Mondays, and here's where we talk about and, and still champion the cause of mental health, and letting it be known that you're not alone. So, how was your week? So, tell me about your week. My week was awesome. It was awesome. Um, I accomplished a lot of things off of my to do list. Got to spend some time with the people that I love. I have a new twin nephews so spending a lot of time with my niece and my nephews has been awesome twin nephews yes. wow like, like babies baby babies baby babies <laughs> you know some people say like oh what a blessing yeah not sleeping well <laughs> well so i get to be the fun aunt i get to give them back so it's you know it's great for me it's great for me <laughs> so so is it your sister or your brother it's my sister Okay, so you guys team up on the husband saying, like, he's wrong and he doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> no, not right? at all. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. He's actually a psychiatrist. I feel like he's, like, the emotional support of everyone. Excellent. <laughs> so what does he think about Mental Health Mondays? I haven't talked to him about it yet. So he's very busy. He's a really, really busy psychiatrist. I'm really um, supportive of him. He has a lot of different businesses. Um, so I haven't gotten an opportunity to talk with him about it specifically yet. But he, um, I know that he's really supportive of anything I'm involved with. So, You know, yeah. we've been having some conversation and some feedback with our different people out there who follow us. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, thank you for all the comments and, and the inboxes. I really, really, truly pr appreciate that people are listening. That that, that that is important. Or people pass it on saying, you know, like, I, I'm listening to this podcast. I'm listening to this this video. And, and, and they're making a difference. They've, they've helped me. And But there are some people out there who are unable to afford it. Mm -hmm. How do we address that? Like, I, I want to get mental health. I know it's something I truly need. I know it's something that has to happen. But now what? Because, right. you know. One of the um, kind of straightforward ways I always tell individuals to at least start the search is to look for a psychological service center that's associated um, with maybe a new psychologist or they may be in training, but that allows for them the flexibility of being with um, a provider that is getting supervision, but it's going to be for a really affordable rate. It also provides you an opportunity to search within that same organization for, and kind of search for multiple providers um, where you can meet with one person. It might not be a good fit. You can meet with another person, but you're going to the same building. You're mm -hmm. going to the same place. Um, and again, they are most of them, if not all, do have a sliding fee scale and they are able to absorb some of that cost for you. So if nothing, I'll start there. But a simple Google search of sliding fee scale therapist will also give you some results. So, you know, I, I, I know black community or people who just don't feel like they are seen or heard, they're like, I got to do another Google search. I got to do this. I got it. It seems to put them off by what? I mean, what do you I mean, I want to say fear, but I also want to say we talked about this before one of the shows of really taking value in yourself. Like we, we want you to value you. So even if it's money, like even if you find a therapist, they're like, it's $6,000 to talk to me, right? And you're like, well, I found one. And ask that therapist, is there some place I can go? Like, you know what I mean? And, and we also know hospitals also have information, Yes. So you, Definitely. you, but now calling the hospital, that seems to be a little bit tedious because they don't know where to, they're like, who do you have an appointment with and, and how, and what do you need? And, and so they're kind of very sketchy when it comes to that. I, I I'm probably sure about that, but mm -hmm. call it, going to the hospital and say, I'm looking for a therapist. What do you think about that idea? 
So when it comes to going to a hospital, I would suggest if you have a scheduled appointment with your primary care physician, okay. that would be the opportunity to have that conversation. It is more challenging to just call in mm-hmm. um, with how busy their systems are. But if you have a scheduled appointment during that time, just make a note to yourself that that's one of the topics that you want to cover while you're meeting with your primary care physician or your OBGYN. For, um, for women, we often have our annual checkups. Mm-hmm. It's a really good time for you to have that conversation. So let's let's get let's talk about a couple things. Let's talk about um, I am not feeling energetic. I'm feeling down. I wouldn't call it depressed. I wouldn't call it this. But I'm not really feeling excited about things anymore. And I'm in a to- toxic environment. I really want to tackle that today. Because there's a lot of things going on there. Like, what do you mean by toxicity? Like, what do you mean by you don't feel like energy? So how would you address that in some of the, some of the answers or questions, so, actually? So one of the things about mental health is the goal is not necessarily to be happy every day. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not a realistic goal, and that's not what we're looking for when we're talking about just a healthy lifestyle or a healthy balance. Um, but what we do want to um, say is, Based on how you're feeling, if you're feeling that it's overwhelming for you, if you're feeling like it's more than you can handle, or if you're feeling that you just want to shift, then those are um, those are the indications or the indicators that it's time for you to go and maybe seek to talk to someone or try and change different things in your environment, like maybe incorporating one of the practices that we've talked about in previous shows, like journaling or meditation or mindfulness, um, and seeing how it impacts your day. And if it's still not helping, then stepping your um, self-care up to another level of seeking a professional. But there are a lot of things that you can do in your daily practice, even some things, some things that are simple, like nutrition. Taking certain things mm-hmm. out of your diet can impact your mood. Or so adding, or adding some. Or adding, exactly, or adding things to your diet can impact your mood. So trying different things, but it has to first start with that self-awareness and then having the um, commitment to yourself to try something different. You know, one of the things I know when I try, when I'm talking to people about that energy thing is, to me it's about self-awareness. Like, where are you feeling it in your body? So if you give yourself the quiet space, right? You Are you feeling it in your head? Are you feeling it in your heart? Are you feeling it in your belly? Is it feeling in your in your bones? Like, where is this way? on you like how does it feel is is or is it a thought process is it, you know because separating between a thought and the physical and things like that and that's something doctors need to understand too like medical doctors right now the sooner more sooner than later you're going to be helping doctors understand this process so how can we help our patients understand this process like you said, it, it does have to do with first taking that moment to take a breath and to ask yourself that question of where am I feeling it? Because some um, patients will come in and they'll say, I, physically I might not feel tired, but just I feel like a fog is in my head. Like yeah. just cognitively I feel tired. And that's when we know it's anxiety and probably not um, not a sleep problem. Um, where mm-hmm. some people come in, they're like, you know, my mind is still going, but my body's just not doing what I need it to do. <laughs> Um, And then we know that maybe we need to talk about sleep hygiene or maybe we need to talk about what you're eating throughout the day. Do you have a lot of red meats in your diet Um, and how that might impact your energy level because your body's processing that versus putting the energy to other things like your cognitive functioning. Um, So, again, it does have to do with you being able to recognize where it's hitting you and then from talk from that place so we can um, see what intervention would work the best. You know, some of you guys have any questions. I know we're live on YouTube and also on on, um, Twitter. So if you have any questions, you can actually put um, a a live question link in here and we can get to you right away. If not, you can always reach me at drpaulholisticscience.com. So if you see me looking away, that's probably a lot of the things I'm trying to see if anyone has any questions. But if we're as we get into different, like, what types of therapies help certain people is that something we could actually specifically say today you think or it just needs to be a felt process for people so it it, it's both um for some they come in with a specific thing and there is a specific therapy that can um that can be used to intervene or to work with whatever the challenge that they're bringing in um so for example you might be coming in with insomnia i just can't sleep 
So there is what we call um, sleep focus or um, sleep hygiene, which is going to tweak your behaviors. It's more behavioral, but it tweaks your behaviors and your environment so you can get better sleep. Um, you might be coming in with something like a trauma, and there are trauma-focused interventions that are going to work on that specific trauma or that specific phobia that you have. For some people, it can be something more general, like this Black Lives Matter movement is happening. I'm, I've been protesting. I'm really overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Um, and so with that, I would say make sure that you ask your counselor if they do a cultural, responsive, cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, that culturally responsive piece means that the therapist has an understanding of your culture's history, their trauma history, and how that, and their ongoing traumatic stress and how that's impacting your experience. That means that they've had some type of specialization or some type of additional education in your culture and the history of your culture. So they're going to better be able to help what you're going through right now. And that's important because sometimes, you know, therapists want to help people, but they may not understand who you are, you know, and, and that's really okay you know we don't understand every we understand human behavior we understand conditions we understand trauma but that doesn't really mean they understand who you are and as a therapist i think that's very blatant to say you know what i can't help you you know and and i i will help find to help help you find someone that can help you Exactly. And I think it has to do with you being able to articulate what it is that you need or what it is that you're looking for. So the therapist can honestly say, yes, I can help or no, I don't have that specialty. I cannot help, but I can help connect you with someone who can. Um, And a part of it might just be a felt thing, like you mentioned earlier, where you go away and you don't feel like there's a connection. You don't feel like they're fully understanding Mm -hmm. it. And that's enough. You don't have to be able to verbalize it. Just having that feeling of something being off is sufficient for you to say, you know, I think I would like for you to help me connect with someone else. You know, when we talk about trauma, and and, and, and I know it seems like we, we beat this thing over and over, but there's so many different types of trauma. Right. So since there's so many different types, because someone can see have trauma by things they have seen before, not things that yeah, not things that was done to them. And I think let's explain that difference between it still has an effect on you and it creates a trauma. Absolutely, and that's what we call vicarious trauma. Yeah. Um, and that's, again, the trauma that's not necessarily experienced firsthand, but it is. it does, you do display traumatic um, symptoms after experiencing the event vicariously through someone else or through another medium. Social media is one of the ways that we do vicariously mm-hmm. traumatize ourselves unintentionally as we keep replaying certain videos, as we um, keep having certain conversations that are igniting, um, that we are experiencing trauma. Even though we're sitting in the comfort of our own home behind mm-hmm. the screen, right. we are experiencing vicarious trauma, and then we exhibit some of those um, some of those symptoms. Like we can't sleep; we, it's hard for us to focus. There's a fear response when you hear a police siren now, um, and so on and so forth. I know, you know, it, 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 trust me, I don't, it, it, not trust me, but I have trauma in so many different ways, and yet a police siren behind me, and my heart's coming through my chest, and it upsets me, and I don't get it, I don't, I don't get arrested. Have I been arrested? Yes. Have I been in jail? Yes. But I have not, like, I don't get tickets or anything like that, and so to have, to have that thing in my head, like, oh, no. Like, mm-hmm. am I going to get pulled over? And I'm like, I didn't do anything wrong. Why should I think about getting pulled over? You know, I haven't, you know, so, but that's a trauma. That's something that is affecting me and it's infecting me. And, and as much as I do my own self healing and healing and, and modalities and things like that, that's something that just sticks with me. As soon as I hear it, my heart races, my intentional go, Okay, yeah, my tags are up to date. You know, is my license, okay. is my license, is my license in a car? You know, <laughs> I just, you're like, uh, I'm sweating. Oh my God, is it something they may think I'm like nervous? or? And it's like, I, this is incredible trauma that I feel for my whole life. And, uh, and to take it even to another level, um, I had a client that was talking about how they were driving and they saw an individual pulled over who had the same make and model as her black son. So she made a full 360 to drive mm. by to make sure that that person wasn't her son. Um, and she ended up being late for work and she didn't care. And there were consequences because of that. But 
um, that goes into the vicarious trauma aspect of it where it can, maybe the police didn't even pull you over, but you see the make and model of the car of someone that you know or someone that you love, and then that triggers a certain response that wouldn't be there if there wasn't a trauma that was, um, that was playing out within you. Now, let's talk about the vicarious trauma. What are some of the ideas you would suggest to work with this? Because as I've been healing through this myself, I because it's not a rationalization that, that doesn't work for me. Like I know I'm I know I'm okay. I know I didn't do anything wrong. It all this that doesn't stop the immediate heart rise, right? And the immediate thought like, huh? And then I'm like, and then I'm and I say to myself, this is what I say, people. I say, I'm okay, I am truth, I am life, I am love. So I give myself a self-affirmation, not because I'm trying to cover up what I'm feeling, but to try to say, I felt this, I'm okay with this, and this is what's going on, but I'm also positive with myself. Absolutely. So one thing that I think is important to bring into this conversation is the fact that a lot of us aren't taught how to self-soothe. Mm. Um, and so when we find ourselves in stressful situations, that is not the time to start building up your self-soothing techniques. Um, affirmations are really good ones. Breathing is another one. Your breath is always with you and it can always ground you. But I always tell patients, just like a football player can't come to the Super Bowl and that's the first game they've had all year. They had to build up to the Super Bowl mm -hmm. um, that they need to practice whatever their self-soothing techniques are before they get into that stressful event. And we can um, record their uh, their heart rates, their blood pressure, and we can see that with enough practice, once you get into that stressful situation, if you've had sufficient practice, you can actually bring your own heart rate, bring your own blood pressure bring, down, bring down in the moment. But it does take that practice. So first, figure out what works for you. Try the affirmations. Try the breathing. Try the mindfulness. Try the meditation. Um, try a number of different techniques. And then practice it while you're calm so you can learn what it feels like to be calm. So when that stress response happens, you have an idea or memory of that calm response. And you can call your, your brain back down and call your, um, your reflexes back down in that moment. Yeah, because your body has a memory. Your your body will remember, and, and, and things are stored in the body. And that's where I get into the cell, but on a cellular level, how your body has learned your thoughts by the, the different synapses and the different triggers you have in your body. And so, re, not retraining it, but giving it new information, new interpretation of how you're going to respond to this is very highly important. Now, Fear is fear is a mother. <laughs> fear is a, you know, <laughs> fear is a is one of those things that just holds on, like barnacle, like mud, like it just it just holds on, and then it leaves residuals. It leaves stuff behind, like don't forget me. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the residuals are really the part that yeah. people don't realize because it doesn't feel like trauma anymore. Like, oh, that's just an echo. That's just like it happened way <laughs> over there. That's nothing. But those residuals, um, as you kind of mentioned, neurons, the neurons that fire together, wire together. So when one is triggered, that whole neural network is triggered. And then that entire peer response happened. It's like, what? That happened years ago. Where is this coming from? But that residual was enough to kind of tug that string for that collapse to happen. You know, when it comes to the, the, the triggering of the response, and once they realize, once a person realize, and I want to say thank you for everyone for listening to Bridges Live on Mental, Mental Health Mondays, and please, if you have any questions, you can contact us. But when we talk about residual information, is that, do you believe that's a time for you to change your interpretation, or is that the time for you to acknowledge the information you had already have? Do you so, I, it depending on how okay. your brain processed the initial event, then right. it could be either or. Because okay. a lot of times what happens with trauma is 
the, the memory isn't stored in a way that's based in reality. Right. Because the emotion is so intense, the way that we remember the emotion is inaccurate. So sometimes it, it does take a process of reliving and relearning the act, like just stating it as if it was the news, the facts of what happened. But other times it is really what happened. Um, and so the, that becomes a question of reinterpreting it, reinterpreting the event more from the space of that happened as I remembered it, but that is the past. Right now I'm dealing with the memory. In this current moment, I'm no longer in danger. And then working from that place where, again, that danger was very real when it happened. Mm -hmm. But in this current moment, I'm working with the memory and I can um, step into my present moment from here. And I like what you said about stepping into your present moment. And that, to me, you know, for me, getting into that neuroscience part of it, helping people understand that you're back here into that survival issue, and you need to bring it forward to here into that living action. And that's where you're sick, you know, so then it becomes into being present, you know, and what is present? Present means living, you know. Um, if, if you read all these books and these self, what do you think of these self-help books? Do you think they help or hurt? And I have to tell you, from my personal experience, sometimes I know when people come to me, I think it has hurt them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it, they're all over the place. They're like, it's this, it's this. I'm like, okay, Okay, slow down. Bring the horses back. Feed them. Give them some water. <laughs> you know, let's let's figure out. Let's start from the beginning, right? Because we we need the history. We need to understand where. How come you've added all these horses onto this carriage, and you're still pulling all this stuff, right? You know. So how do you? What do you think about that? And that's the. I think that self help books have their place. And they do have a function, a role that is important. I think the best way for a self-help book to be, you know, helpful is when you are working with a professional who can guide you through some of the um, some of the ideas that are going to be presented in that self-help book, but also who can coach you through the exercises and the practices that are being presented in that book. Because there is such a thing as just overlearning, where you become really intellectual with these experiences, and you don't allow yourself that emotional experience. And it's really within the emotion that the healing happens. The intellect is necessary, but it's not necessarily where the healing happens. you got to let yourself feel that emotion, and it's hard to do that on your own. And that's it. And, and I know when people hear this, say, "Dr. Paul, you've written self help books." I I know. I, I'm sitting. Around, <laughs> and 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 I and I've actually put disclaimers in my self help book. Going like, this is supposed to be helpful, not to take over. You know what I mean? I, I you know things I write. I want people to ask themselves, huh, I never thought of it that way. And mm -hmm. then, you know, a apply it to information you can then ask the professional, like, hey, I, I read this and, and I was thinking, what do you think about this? Then you guys can work it out together. Because it's about development of your, it's about development of your personal self, not development from the book. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And like I always tell my patients, I would say like self-help books are like a supplement where they help with your nutrition and with your body's functioning. But at no point does a supplement replace your nutrition. It doesn't replace the meals that you have throughout the day. The supplements supplement the meals that you have, but you still have to have that substance. And so still have that professional, still have that relationship through which the healing is going to occur. And the self-help books are a wonderful supplement to that um, holistic experience. You know, we, we touched on it, and I don't want to run over because we talked about people not being able to afford it. We also talked about the value of yourself. And, and I don't, and I really want to stress the idea of value yourself. Not value yourself in what you think you ought to be. I think that's not the same as valuing yourself of who you are. Now, I can hear the, 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 you know the voices in the wilderness. I never knew who I was. So what? So what then is my value? How would you? How would you think we want to attack that today on Mental Health Mondays? The main thing I would say is you have a curiosity and understanding who you are. Okay. And from there, that's where the motivation and the inspiration will come. So there, um, and I don't know the name of the individual, but. You spoke of someone who had the idea of starting a GoFundMe page in order yeah. to raise, yeah. um, in order to raise money. 
for mental health for um, individuals that are the minority community. So when people want to achieve certain goals, if they really want it, they'll figure out a way to do it. But it has to be important to you. And you have to be willing to sometimes think outside of the box. And so it starts with a genuine curiosity and a desire to learn about who you are and then seeking out how to do that. But I think that if you don't even ask yourself that question, right. then you're not going to find the path towards finding it. But you don't have to know who you are you, just right. now. You just don't. You really don't. You, you, you just got to, you, you know, because I know it's it's often in this system we are set up in, you're defined by the things you're doing. And mm-hmm. that's not good either, you know, because you're not only defined by the things you are, you're doing, you know. No, so no, that's not who you are. It's what you do. And um, I was ta- listening to um, uh, Pastor was giving a sermon, and he was saying that his uh, his advisor was asking him like, "Who are you?" He was like, "Oh, my name is da da da." Like, that's your name. That's not who you are. He was like, "Well, I do this." I was like, "Well, that's what you do, but that's not who you are." I was like, "Well, I like this. Well, that's what you like, but that's not who you are." So again. Just having that curiosity and that desire to find out is definitely the first step. But understanding that all of these things aren't who you are. Who you are is much deeper than that and much more vast than that. Um, and seeking the people that will help you explore and then understand who you are. You know, you, you, you mentioned it. We pray before. We pray. If most of you don't know, we pray before we actually get on air. And we pray, you, you've probably been a part of it. What do you think about the spiritual practice and mental health is there a place where they mesh or is it would you think it's separate i believe it meshes i believe i believe your spirituality and your soul and your heart and your mind your physical all have to really do you belong together and moving in one unison of energy Uh, but i think some people's spirituality or their religion is not in sync with them and I think mm-hmm. that also causes some some unhealthiness. Absolutely. And I would even venture out to say that that can be the cause of certain mental health challenges mm. that you're experiencing and some confusion that you're experiencing, especially the identity piece of it. Um, and so one thing I often ask whoever I'm seeing or whoever I'm, I'm referring a client to is what is your understanding of how the spiritual aspect of the individual plays into their mental health experience because it's all one person your physical health your mental yeah. health your spiritual health it's all one person if all of them are not being addressed and there's something that's going to get missing there's something that's not going to be addressed and you're not going to feel fully fulfilled in your experience and that doesn't mean that you have to have any kind of religious belief no. but there is, no. there does need to be an understanding that there's a physical and there's a non-physical aspect of you that both need to be tended to you know, I, I, I love our Mental Health Mondays, and I, I just think we hit it hard. We really attack some things that, that doesn't normally get talked about. I listen to some other mental health shows, and it just seems like they're painting over mud. And I, and I, I, I know it's tough when it comes to the behavioral science, right, and the cognitive behavioral therapies. We cannot get into specific specifics, because like you said once before, everything is specific to who you are. That's, that's why if it seems so light, it's because it's only until you have a relationship with one yourself, next your therapist, that you can move in the right direction. Definitely. Absolutely. I completely agree. So until people find, and I hope people find, and I know um, we had gotten an email about it being expensive, and I hope people um, um, find something and start a GoFundMe page. And and I love that idea about um, sharing mental health costs as a community because I I, I thoroughly believe, I really, just there's just no doubt about it that for us people as human beings to be a happy human being as a culture of beings that we need to understand who we are and understand our self-care and self-care is so important definitely and then understand yourself within these various systems that you're functioning in because a lot of times we tend to compartmentalize but all those emotions and experiences exist within you so understanding how to merge them and integrate them and then um, navigate all of them at the same time in a healthy way is really important 
So we're going to be wrapping up here. We we, we love to tackle this uh, mental health Mondays, and we'll see you everyone next Monday. Well, actually, we're going to take Monday off. I wanted to just so let you know that we're going to take um, next Monday off. So we'll have a little bit of a break here, but we'll see everyone back. And I believe it's the third of August. And um, is there anything you want to say, Doctor? Only before we take off here. Again, I just want to remind everyone that if cost is a problem, please look into the Psychological Services Center of the university that is close to you, and that would be a great place to start. Because if they can't help you, they definitely have a list of resources that they've compiled. So please reach out to them and start there. And if you ever want to contact Dr. Only or myself, please contact me here at um, Bridges Live or Dr. Paul Science.com, and I can um, put you in touch with Dr. Only. If you want to ask her something specific, um, please give out your um, contact information. So um, you can reach me at onyanukam at gmail.com. That's spelled O N Y I dot A N U K E M at gmail.com. Awesome. And we're going to sign off here, and we're going to pray. So thank you, everyone. Bow your heads. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for bringing us together. Thank you for allowing our words to be heard and felt. Thank you for people to allow their energies to come together so they can find out who their true self is. And if we put you to the almost high, we can become ultimate beings. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thanks, Dr. Only. Thank you. I will see you later. All right. Mm-hmm.